Father, we are gathered this wonderful morning, praising your name. We thank you because this is your work and this is your mission. You say that you're building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. And we thank you that, Father, we are gathered here in Kalaleshua, desiring to build this church so that your kingdom can be advanced in this area. We pray as we share your word this morning, speak to us, minister to us. You are our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, you'll allow me to see them a bit far distant <laughs> from everyone. Uh, remove my mask. Uh, which is, I've done the sanitization. It's such a joy to be here. It's been a very busy week for me. Uh, we had a uh, whole star week for staff meeting uh, staff from across the country uh, at Focus and also our international body, the senior leadership is around actually. They are visiting Nairobi Baptist where I, I, I fellowship, but I told them I won't be with them. And there are three reasons why I needed to be here. Number one reason is that I'm a product of PCEA. I got born in Subukia. I was baptized in PCA Subukia, pres, pres, uh, like, like keep a presbytery, and I grew up there as a young person. And uh, when I went to high school, I wasn't born again. In Form 2, I met Jesus. Amen. I got saved at PCA Namachaki Parish, Nyeri town. So whenever I get an invitation from PCA Church, what can you do? You just have to say no to everything else. <laughs> and go. The other reason is, whenever I hear a church plant, my heart moves faster. And I have to stop what I'm doing and go to that church plant because of a few things I'll share with us this morning. And the last thing is, I've been involved in fundraising, and as I serve as a national director of Focus Kenya, Focus is the fellowship of Christian unions we take care of your, student, your children in universities and colleges in this country. We are in 186 Christian unions across the country. All the public universities have a Christian union. Some of them will shock you. They are big. The biggest we have is Kenyatta University. The CU has 3,000 members. They have three Sunday services as I speak now. They meet from 7 up to around 1. Three Sunday services. Kenyatta University has 2,500 members. Masai Mara has 1,500. Chuka University has 2,000 members. Across the country, all the CUs have 55,600 Christian students. And we thank God for that. So we are all in all universities and public, uh, public and private uh, universities and also colleges, and we are trusting God to get to the Tibets. We have about 200 of them that we desire to move there. And we are doing ministry there. Uh, they are running Sunday services. They have discipleship, Bible study, uh, Bible study evangelism, and nurturing new believers. And last year when freshers were joining campus, we did uh, a campaign for each fresher for Christ in all our CUs in the universities. And 4,800 freshmen and women got saved Amen. across the country. Amen. That's the work that is happening Amen. out there. So when I hear of a church plant, um, I do lots of fundraising. I fundraise for Focus. I have a budget of 50 million this year, which I must fundraise for. And we are, we are, raising, uh, we are building a student training center at Kasarani and other regions, and I have a budget of 300 million. So when I hear people are fundraising for the kingdom of God, I have to join them as a beggar uh, who knows uh, where to find bread. <laughs> so you can find bread for this. So that's why the three reasons why I needed to be with us today. The topic we are sharing on this morning is building the walls, rescuing our generation. I've decided to pick two biblical characters from the Old Testament who I think and I feel, and you bear my, with my passion, I deal with students, so I'm, I have to be passionate, because they are young people. But also, the topic I'm sharing with is from my heart, and it's what made me to ask Nairobi Baptist to release me and go be a missionary 
to young people who's out there. I decided to pick two characters from the Bible who I think represent this generation. I'll start with the global issues and why we need to fundraise uh, at a global level and then I'll come down to Kelelesua, this road here, <laughs> and this area. So journey with me on a global scale and then we'll come down and see what that means for us. These two biblical characters, Nehemiah and Esther, found themselves in a quite unique, tricky position. Very mixed, almost similar. Nehemiah was a young man when he was taken from, uh, by, uh, uh, rather, to exile, when Judah was invaded by the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar was a unique king. What he used to do, if he would conquer a place, he would not just destroy everything. He would pick the brilliant young minds and take them to Citadel of Susa, the headquarters of his superpower, to actually work for the king, a very brilliant king. <laughs> he will leave, he will destroy things that uh, the old sheep and cows, and I don't know what was happened to the old men, uh, but he wasn't picking them. <laughs> and women. He was picking the Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's brilliant minds, and Nehemiah's. Nehemiah finds himself as the cup bearer to the king. He is in Citadel of Susa, the superpower state house then. Nehemiah, as he's working and privileged, some people come from the village back home and they ask him, how is home? I mean, he asks them, how is home? And they say, we are in great trouble. The walls are broken and we are in shame. The worship of Yahweh is not as those days when we were known to be, the, to be people who worship God. And the whole chapter 1 and 2 of Nehemiah says, Nehemiah wept, he prayed between the months of Nisan and Kislev. Check chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, and chapter 2, verse 2, you'll find those two months. It shows they are actually, according to the Jewish culture, those are uh, around December and uh, April, the following year, about four months, Nehemiah was in prayer. He was mourning and praying, but he decided to take an action. After the other side, Coincidence has it, there is a king, powerful king, who is celebrating. And he calls the wife, the queen, uh, to, show he, to show her off. But the queen refuses for whatever reason to come. And we all know the story. The queen is, can no longer continue being the queen. And somehow, the, by God's grace, Esther, as a young lady, is picked to be the queen. And as when she's picked to be the queen, there is a guy called Haman, and Haman is an official of the king, a powerful man who wants everyone to bow. And as he walks to the state house, there is a man called Mordecai who is a cousin to Esther, an older cousin who took care of Esther who didn't have parents. And Mordecai can't bow because he only knows he bow to God, according to the Jewish culture. And Haman becomes angry and plots to destroy all the Jewish people, including Mordecai. That time, Esther has become the queen. And Mordecai sends a word to Esther. There is a plan to destroy every Jew. And Esther says, now what can I do? You don't go to the queen. You don't take yourself there. <laughs> the way our children nowadays take us themselves to ourselves. I remember my father. You didn't just go to your father just like that. And I, some of you are from that generation. Where you have to check the state of your father, whether he's angry or happy, for you to go. Yeah. The kings, you didn't just go. Esther says, I haven't been caught for 30 days. How can I go? Whoever goes, if you're not caught, you'll be killed. Mordecai tells Esther, you are in such a place at such a time as this for a reason. If you don't do anything, salvation will come from somewhere else. And you and your family will perish. And Esther says, Pray for me. I will go. If I perish, I perish. Mm -hmm. I pick those two cases to help us see what is happening globally in terms of the body of the church and help you see 
the importance of a church plant in Kerelishua. Because we give not just for the sake of giving, we give for a bigger vision. We give because there's a bigger vision that God has called us into. I'll pick two stories that have moved me so much in the last few years. One of it, I met three months ago, I met an 84-year Norwegian professor who had visited this country and they are working very hard as a scientist, working very hard to counter the, the evolution theory by a theory that is being called intelligent design. Okay, uh, we have people who... Uh, let me break that down a bit. <laughs> intelligent design is a theory that shows creation that there must, be, there must have been an intelligent, intelligent designer who designed creation. There is no way these flowers, the colouring, sorry, uh, I didn't I would mess the whole flower, I'll just pick two, for example. Naturally, the mixing of these colours, you see how beautiful it is? Couldn't have happened through Big Bang. That Big Bang, how, how intelligent was it to have such mix of colours? And they have gone through genetical codes and everything to say there must have been an intelligent designer. Now, this old man told us something that has stuck with me. And he said, I'm old, I may not come back to Africa. I plead with you Africans, the church in Africa, do not go the path the church in Europe went. Do not go that path. Why? 150 years ago, Europe was a Christian nation in all ways. Christian culture. North America was. As we speak today, there is a research I, I found last year that shows that 4,000 churches are closing up every year in North America and in Europe. 4,000 churches are closing up, becoming museums or becoming places for art or for ski Skating, skating, 4,000 churches closing up. A place that a hundred or so years ago was the heart of Christianity. Right now, they're in a post Christian era. You may think that that's too far from us in Africa. Let me tell you, it's not. I pick another story from South Korea. South Korea, in the 50s, 30s and 50s, 1950s and 1930s, was largely a Buddhist country. Had only 3% Christian, 3% South Korea. By God's grace, and they were, were in an era of depression and all that, by God's grace from 1960, to around 1990, a span of 30 years, something happened to that country. And revival came. Mm -hmm. The churches started growing. And people started seeking God. To the extent, the church Christianity moved from 3% to 46% by 1995. 46%. To the extent, those who remember a bit of history, South Korea had the biggest church one single assembly in the world in 1994. South uh, Seoul, you might, might just research and you find a church that used to have 700,000 members attending a service. It was a stadium. 700,000 members attending one church. They had a prayer mountain. The pastor used to be called Yogyocho, for those who might have interacted with that. A story of growth of the church, massive, from 3% to 46% in about 30 years. Let me tell you, as we speak today, the church, something has happened in the last 15 years. South Korea, Christianity has dropped to 16%. What is it? What is it? They missed a generation. A generation missed going to church. Of course, economically, they blossomed as a country. But they missed a young generation who disconnected with church. And now the church has been left with only the elderly. 
and they are about 16%, and we pray they don't go back to 3%. Why am I sharing those stories? We have a generation to rescue. My theological training some years back, I interacted with a book that changed my life forever. <laughs> that book is about the next Christ, Christendom. And the author of that book, Philip Jenkins, argues and captures the history of the church since Christ was on earth. And says, as we speak, the epicenter of global Christianity, epicenter, the heart of it, has shifted from the global north to the global south. 60% of all global Christians are in the global south. And global south, sub-Saharan Africa is at the heart of it. And Kenya, we are at the heart of it. That is by God's grace. To the extent now we need to start sending missionaries back to the north. Now, what does that mean to me? And what does that have to do with our pockets this morning? I mean, you could be asking, what does that have to do with my pocket or my ATM this morning? Let me break that down for you. I believe, and I'm a church historian, I like church history, because unless you know where you're coming from, you can't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. The church in the West had Christianity for about 500 years, since the days of Martin Luther King. Uh, not Martin Luther King, that's the reason. Martin Luther the reformer, the earlier one, who was there in the 16th century. They were faithful in many ways. They actually ensured we got Christianity, including the missionaries from Scotland, who helped us here. They did their best. Unfortunately, now they need help. In Africa, we have had this faith for about 100 years. About 50 years, by branch after the East African revival and the like of the 60s. I'm asking myself, shall we be faithful as the custodians of global Christianity? Because we are. We are the epicenter of global Christianity. These are places where churches, as they close 4,000 there, here there are 6,000 are open in every year. <laughs> Which is a blessing. The Christianity is with us. Shall we be faithful? Everyone else is looking at us. And that's why I want, I'm sharing this morning on building the walls, rescuing this generation. Because the two examples I've given you, it takes only a short time for a generation to lose faith. We just need to do nothing for a few years. And 15 years, 30 years, a generation can lose faith. And because of that, I want to help us see Three things that are important as we engage this morning. Giving as a means of advancing the kingdom of God. Giving as a means of advancing the kingdom of God. Giving as an honorable worship. And giving as an act of service. What do I mean by giving as a means of advancing the kingdom of God? We find the call of Nehemiah was a call of what we call structural and spiritual renewal. They both go together. You need the structure that helps and gives, lays the platform for spiritual renewal. Nehemiah knew the people would not worship Yahweh well if the walls are broken, if the temple is not built. And as he was doing that, he had to do that as Ezra came along to ensure people start reading the law again, the law of the Lord. But you find in the journey of Nehemiah, which is very interesting, and I wish we had time. He's one of the heroes I love most. He's one of my um, mentors. I have a mentor in the Bible. Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a strategist. A strategist who puts prayer fast, takes four months of prayer and fasting. And after that, he goes to the king in chapter 2 to ask for materials to build, for security to go back across the trans euphrates so that he can be able to rebuild. In chapter 3, he mobilizes people, 52 different groups, including Arabs. He was such a mobilizer. <laughs> including sons of Tekoa, priests to build, and the wall is actually 
eventually was done by 52 days. But in chapter 4, it's very interesting. When they are halfway building the wall, and I don't know how, whether we are halfway in terms of fundraising, we are three quarter away, or we are almost getting there. I think the last I met with the fundraising team, we weren't too far. But I guess the fundraising we are doing is for the land first. Yes, for the land first. I envision, and I trust God when I'll be passing through this road, I'll see a three, four, five story building. Because I don't think you have options, because you don't have. You can only go up, not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless you buy off. <laughs> and they should not hear. But they'll be bought off. <laughs> unless you expand this way, the option you have is to go up. Okay? And I think here you can go up to even 10th floor. Why not? And have a school <laughs> on 9th and 10th floor. Have a church uh, somewhere around there. You have a long way to go. That's the point. Like Nehemiah, in chapter 4, he gets that point where the walls have been built and they're halfway. And the enemy comes from outside. Friends, the enemy won't sit pretty for you to advance the kingdom of God here. He won't. He knows if you do the work well, God will be worshipped. You rescue the drunkards around here. You rescue people who are, don't know Christ around here. That happened to Nehemiah. Verse 6, so we built the wall till, um, till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. And I pray you work with all your heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah and Arabs, and the men of Ashdod heard of the repairs of Jerusalem, they hadn't heard. Some of the enemies haven't heard that yet what you're doing. They will hear when they start seeing what you're doing. When they heard, they actually arose, they came up, and they all plotted together to come and fight against the Jerusalem and start up trouble against it. But we prayed, we prayed. Friends, you have a God in heaven Amen. who will help you. Amen. We shall do this through prayer. Amen. You must do this through prayer, because some of the battles will be spiritual, they will not require physical war. <laughs> okay? There are some battles you require to meet the leaders of the area, the MCA, around. <laughs> but there are some battles who will be won through the knees. We prayed, as the Bible says, verse 8. Meanwhile, as the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble. Now, that's an internal battle. The other one was external. Internally, people are getting tired. You have had 50 fundraisers. And people are wondering, surely, when shall you finish? <laughs> okay? Okay, I'm not saying you have had 50, but I suspect by the time you do 10 yeah, floor, yeah. <laughs> you'll be at 50 or 60 fundraisers. And it might be in chapter, verse, 10, verse 10 of chapter 4 of Nehemiah. Meanwhile, the people of, in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble. We cannot rebuild the wall. Also the enemy said, before they know it, our seers will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Some of you will be saying, you'll be put in that committee and say, oh, I might get pressure and die out of diabetes <laughs> before I finish for the fundraising. Or I might get this, or I might get this, or my... I mean, the enemy will speak to you. Or I might lose my job because it's full-time job. This is what Nehemiah did, and this is my encouragement this morning, in verse 13. I therefore stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by their families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I, say, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid. That is my message for you this morning. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? Remember the Lord. Who is great and awesome. Amen. This is God's work. God is at work in Africa. He is building his church. And most likely, he wants the stone that was rejected by the rest of the world. <laughs> the countries that seemed that like nothing, they were called what? What were we? Is that world or fourth world? Yeah. Dark continent. You remember those terms? Dark. God may be wanting to ashamed the wise by using the foolish. 
God, maybe that's why God has spared the church in Africa and make us to grow as we are growing. As I see the students in CU's Christian unions lack in space in Chuka University, they meet in the graduation square because there's no hall. It's the work of God. Amen. Remember the Lord God. It is God who is building his church in Kereleshua. Friends, he, God is only using the brand PCA. <laughs> but it's God's church. Amen. It's God's church. He has only called St. Andrews and told you, you seem like you can make it because God uses according to ability. That's why he didn't call the other one. He called you because he said you are able. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord your God. But I like what Nehemiah said. And fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. In each new church plant, it is fighting for our grandchildren. We have a serious onslaught of postmodernism ideologies. And they are lethal. Or what you call relativism, pluralistic, pluralistic mindsets are with us. Secularism is with us. When I was growing up, I only knew every child goes to Sunday school. I didn't know anything else. Today, you have children who are growing as atheists. They haven't heard about Bible stories anywhere. We are growing in very difficult times when we are not sure which gender is which or who, who is marrying who. Those are the issues with the young people out there. It's a global village. Shall we fight for our children? Your giving today is laying a stone for the sake of your great, great grandchildren. Amen. You may actually not be the one who benefits from it as much, but who knows your great grandchild might just stay around here and come and fellowship in this church. We are fighting for our children. Structural, giving as a means of advancing the kingdom of God is because we need structural and spiritual renewal. We need to preserve the fruit secure in the future. How do we preserve that fruit? We have a youth barge in the third world and the shift of the global Christianity. And because of that, as Nehemiah, we must build tight walls. But also, we must avert the dangers that are there, as Esther did. We have serious dangers, cultural, ideological threats to Christian values today. And as Esther said, if I perish, let me perish, but I must do something. Mm -hmm. Shall you do something to avert this uh, onslaught to the Christian faith that we have today? Mm -hmm. And we can only do that as we build the church of God. Have a place for worship. And after that, ensure it is a place for worship. Because it is not enough to have land and build a building. You can build it and have no people who are worshiping. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we need to have that in the right perspective. We don't want just to have a structure. Hardware, it's called hardware. You don't just repair hardware, you also repair the software. We need young people to find a place here. We need the old to find a place here. But also given as a non of worship. The first one was given as a means of advancing the kingdom. The second one is given as a non of worship. Why do we give? Giving is acknowledging that we are stewards. What we have is not ours. It's not. Haggai chapter 1 uh, and also chapter 2. God says, all silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Actually, he only gave you as a custodian. A steward is a custodian. Some of you maybe have interacted with custodians of apartments. Uh, when you are younger, when you rented, uh, let's say, in Kidurai or somewhere. And there's that caretaker who used to behave like the owner. And they were so tough. Until maybe some of you knew the owner. And when they had us, you, you do a message to the owner. And you see the guy the next day begging you, please don't report me to the owner. That's how we treat money with us, like owners. This money does not belong to us. Why? Psalms 24 verse 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything means even the money in your wallet belongs to God. And there's a way God can pick it and give another person who can manage it well. <laughs> and I you know in my mother tongue, we say money has wings, can fly. Today can be with this brother, the next minute it flies to the other one. And you're wondering, oh, I left you so much money in the village. How, what happened? It flew. <laughs> because 
It belongs to God. We are stewards. Once we know that, then we ask the owner of the money, what do you want us to use this money for? And I think in Africa right now, every Christian should be thinking of how to spend that money to advance and build the body of Christ and empower this generation so that we can give back to the world the faith that was given back to us. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 is asking, what do you have that you did not receive? We are stewards. And because we are stewards, we give what I say heart giving, heart giving, is where we give as a result of surrendered hearts. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 5 talks about the Macedonian church. Macedonian church gave beyond what they had. Out of poverty they gave more. Why? It actually says they first gave themselves to the Lord. Then gave all their substance. That is heart giving. It is not by coercion. That's why Second Corinthians also chapter 9 Paul argues and says, our giving must be willingly and according to ability. I know we have too much of gymnastics out there with many men of God, so-called men of God, who use laws of gymnastics uh, <laughs> to get money out of people. Uh, I suspect you have seen some, eh? Some will argue, I'm the planter seed, I'm the fertile ground. Okay? And you're wondering, how come there's only one fertile ground in the whole congregation? Planting seed is important, but it can't just be to the man of God. It's only the man of God driving the nice car and everyone else is walking in the congregation. Yet, actually, the, the church should be given to the poor and helping. It's the reverse that should be happening. But the Bible says in 1 2 Corinthians 9 7, give with a cheerful heart. Don't be coerced because you know we have a bigger vision of a global church. When you look, if I had time, I could have taken you to Exodus 35, verse 4, where God insisted on people giving willingly and out of ability. And they gave so much until they were stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, just allow me that uh, Exodus 35, maybe you just refer to that quickly as we wind up. Exodus 35, uh, for those who have their, their Bibles, the whole chapter, materials for the tabernacle. This is a time. And God spoke to Moses, and Moses said in verse 4, chapter, uh, that 5 of Exodus, uh, verse 4, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From you, what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing is to bring, is to bring, everyone who is willing, so there's no coercion, mm -hmm. is to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet, yarn, fine linen, goat hair, including goat hair. At a point you'll be building and you need even windows. <laughs> or whatever, whatever, bring it. Ram skin, dyed red, hides of sea cows, acacia wood, olive oil, for the spices for an, uh, or anointing oil, fragrant incense, literally everything. The list goes on. Verse 20. Then the whole Israel community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to the Lord. Giving from the heart. Let me take you to chapter 36, verse 3. Let's see the results there. They received from Moses all the offerings that the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offering morning after morning. So all the skilled craftsmen who had doing all the work on the sanctuary left. Um, uh, uh, left their work and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for the doing, for doing the work the Lord commanded the people. And Moses gave an order. Here, listen to this order. And they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. How I pray we can be at that level. Well, we actually say it's enough for buying the land. Okay, we'll be opening the account for construction next month. Wait. <laughs> How I pray the African church can get to that level. Africa, uh, and unfortunately, I think we have we were wired that we don't have. And I like the philosophy of PCA church in terms of local support that we don't have to depend on any other person. 
And that's very helpful because there is a way, as Africans, you are told, unless you receive from the missionaries, you can't do anything. But we have what it takes, like the Macedonian churches. Amen. Giving from the heart. Giving as an act of service. As I conclude, friends, Philippians 4, 17, puts it this way. Paul tells the Philippians in Philippians 4, 17, I'm asking you to give. Why? Not because I'm just in need as an apostle. In Philippians 4, 17, it says, Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. <laughs> Paul says, Giving to the work of God is a blessing to you. Not just that work. God has the ability to do the work even without money. Because he can turn stones. I mean, he can turn stones to money. Or he can save people without even a building of a church. He can actually do anything. But Paul here says, it's not that I'm just looking for that money. But I'm looking for what can be credited to your account. You have a heavenly account. And you will discover it when you go to heaven. You had an account. Books will be open of what you did. And Paul is saying, I'm inviting you to, to almost appreciate the owner of silver and gold and say it wasn't mine in the first place and I want to advance the kingdom of God through this giving. Giving is an act of service. Friends, as we do this, we will be able to advance the kingdom of God. Do not give sparingly. God will bless you. What you could be doing is bigger than just June of 2022. <laughs> we are thinking of the global call, the global church, the African church. And I know, as someone mentioned, you are a missionary church. When you are done doing here, a few of you, God might call you to go where? To Kikuyu or somewhere else. <laughs> wherever else. Maybe you need to come to Langata or Karen or whatever. Because we have a call as the African church. May the Lord bless us as we give and as we serve through giving. May the Lord bless this church that it shall be a blessing to generations to come. It shall not just be a structure left idle. It shall be a place where people will find life as they come in here. God bless you. Thank you.